Okay, I have been playing with my stopwatch from last time. Uh, and I'm, because I'm planning how we're going to be doing some animation on our screen. So I'm sort of going to show you how I did it. As if you must do it a different way, it just better be working in the different way you do it if you want to do it a different way. So let me show you, first of all, how do we stop our clock? Remember, we set an action handle. And I'm going to go ahead and put in some comments here. Uh, this handles the pressing or the clicking of the start stop button. And I just realized my comments were backwards. That I was planning to have the stop the counter here when I actually have the code that actually is starting the counter. So I'm erasing the comments I had, putting in what's really happening here is start the clock with a new clock task. And the stop the clock is going to be the else part of this code that I started the clock with. So I'm going to paste my comments here and stopping the clock is super easy. It's just a matter of that task that I started has to be canceled. Well, the problem is, when I first tested this, I made a new clock task, but I didn't save a reference to it anywhere, so I don't have any way to reference it to stop it. So what I need to do is store it somewhere so I can get to it in the stop part of it. So I'm going to do my task, which is a uh, my clock task, my clock task, my task. I want to store the clock task that I, that I create here into my task. The easiest way to do that is I don't have to move any code around. I just say my task, or capital T, task equals. I just add that to the parameter. Now notice what's happening here. I am sending the parameter to the schedule at fixed rate at the same time that I'm storing it in the variable. This is a little, little shorthand. I could have done this on two, two lines. I could have said my task equals new clock task and then schedule at fixed rate my task. But I can do that all on one line here. I have declared it up here. And I can just say, oh, by the way, get me a new clock task, store it in the variable, and at the same time, send its value to as a parameter to this function. I'll zoom out just a tiny bit so you see the whole function. Very common thing when it's a short line. I did this, but I realized I need to keep track of that because down in the stop counter now, I need to do my task dot cancel. Canceling a task stops it from happening any longer. And the next thing I want to schedule, I have to create a new one. The next thing I want to start my clock. Let's verify that this is working. I'm going to run my program. And I've got a few extra things that's through in here as I'm getting ready to practice, do some animation with you of a ball bouncing around on the screen, and well actually moving around on the screen and eventually us getting control over it. Hoping we can get that done today. But here's the start stop part. Start, starts a timer, and stop. Let's see if it stops it. Yes, it stops it. Now if I start it again, uh-oh, the start isn't working again. But at least the start is working. What did I do wrong? I think I remember now. I forgot to say, hey, by the way, keep track that I have stopped my clock. I need to turn start it back to equal false. I forgot to do that. So he just kept stopping a, a timer task that had never been recreated. So now it should, once I stop it, it should start it will be false. And the next time I click, it'll do this. And the next time it'll do this. 
Now, if I want to be sure that started toggles each time, I could have put started equals not started, but I'm making sure after I'm done starting the clock, I set the status of my little Boolean guy, started equals false, or started equals true, depending on if I have started or stopped the timer. Now let's make sure it does that right. And you may notice the formatting of my time looks a little different than last time. I have two digit hour, minute, second separated by colon. Because what had happened is here, I, I had left it running yesterday, and I came and my seconds were like 5,000 or something. And I realized, wait a minute, I want to see hour, minute, second here. So before we start playing with animating of this little arc down here, let's see how I did that. I can start this. We'll make sure start and stop works. Oh, stop works. Uh, let's see if it starts again. Yes, and it starts back at zero. Why does it start back at zero? Well, in my timer task, when I create a new timer task, D time gets reset to zero because I'm re I'm creating a new task. I am not pausing a task. If there were a task pause. I, I could pause and have a lap reset, but I don't think there's a my task pause. Let's just check my task dot. Nope, there is no my task dot pause. Hey, Jared. Oh, he showed up. He'll come back. So we have set we have set the code to stop my stopwatch. Again, how I did that? Created a variable to keep track of the task. The reason I did that is because I need to reference it in order to cancel it. Without storing it in a local variable, I have simply passed a new clock task to the scheduler, but there's no way for me to know what that task was unless I had saved it in a variable called my task. There is a dot wait. Is there a dot wait? You could try that, but I'm going to. Uh, show you how I did that formatting first. So notice the formatting I have. Two digit, hour, minute, second, hour, minute, second, and hundreds of a second. Let me show you that how that's done. The string dot format is a wonderful friend. And I'm just going to bop you right into the code I did because I had to go Make sure I knew it. I, I did a little experimenting and got it to work. And oh, we're down here. It's in the timer task, right? The timer clock task, which is down here. Here's my clock task. Take a look at this. This is the code that gives you hour, minute, second format. First thing I did was, well, I'm updating my time by one one hundredth of a second. And I'm going to put in a little comment here. This only works correctly if this timer is set to 10 millisecond interval. A warning there. That I am assuming my timer is running every one hundredth of a second. I increment my, my stored variable, my double variable time by one one hundredth. And look at what I'm doing here. I am figuring out my, the number of seconds I have is my total time mod 60, meaning what's left over after I uh, divide by 60. Because it's a double, that will include the hundredths of a second in there. If I want to know the total minutes I have, well, I divide my total time by 60, but then I round away any decimals. That's why I put that inside of math.round. The number of hours, divide by 3600 minutes times, or seconds in a minute times seconds in an hour. And then I round away, I do the round to get rid of decimals, ending at the decimal, and I get the digit or the double number of hours. And the total number of days that my clock has been running is divide by the number of total number of seconds in a day, round it, and that'll give me the number of days that my timer has been running. 
But here comes the incantation for string format. Remember for string format, and let's just again go to a website. This is something that you're going to want to regularly reference. I'm just going to go to Java string format in my search bar, Java string that format, and there's thousands of helpful rate references out there searching for Java string that format, Java tutorial point, docs.oracle.com. I'm going to go there because I feel they're more authoritative. Sometimes it's harder to read, but let's see how well they explain uh, string formatter. They show you some examples and some expect ex uh, how it's supposed to work. Let's see if they give me a table of the formatting parameters. Here we go. The conversion character comes at the end. I start with a print, a percent sign. Let's see what we get. Let's look at an example. Then we'll then we'll see uh, this example. Uh, this is sort of a decent example. Anything in our formatter that says, "Hey, I'm going to treat something special here," I, I start with a percent symbol, and then there's parameters and things after the percent symbol that. And then a, finally a letter saying what I am converting into some format. And they give some examples of percent TT writes a formatted string. So maybe I could have done percent TT, but I had I decided to do that by conversion hours and then second myself. This will only work if I have some variable in the form of whatever format time is in a in a in a uh, in a nu uh, number represent representative number called a a time well I was kept counting I was just building a double uh, just a double number so I don't think this would work for a double I have to find hours minutes second myself but this is showing you that if I want to format something special I have a format string it ignores everything until it comes to a percent symbol and then it says okay you're giving me a variable that I'm going to treat in a special way and I'm expecting to find one two three variables after this formatting string and or actually in this case I'm saying take the take the first variable you'll find and put it in different formats here Treat it like a time variable and give me the month. Here, treat it like a time variable and give me the uh, day. And give me the time variable and give me the year. And it's kind of strange how it all works, but it's based on this formatting table down here. And the one we're looking at for my specific example is... I'm looking at a floating point number and I want to display it in a certain uh, format. I want to see two digits with leading zeros. See if they explain the leading zero parts of this in their documents. Here's some flags. Here we go. If I have a zero in a flag, which comes after the percent sign, that means I'm padding it with zeros. Well, Oracle, as usual, has a very detailed but somewhat abstract discussion about it and some examples if you dig deep enough through. Let's look at that first one, Tutorials Point. Let's see if they make that one a little easier to understand. If I go to Tutorial Point, they show that, oh, here we go. If I want to display value of a floating point number, 32.33434, point percent F, it'll come out just like that. If I want to print it out with 32 possible digits and 12 digits after the decimal point, I print it out with this format and I get something strange like this. 32 digits with Instead of leading zeros, there's 32. Let's however, let's see. It had 12 digits, so that would be 
21, no, 17 digits here, including spaces, leading spaces. That's why this is coming up so far. 32 digits total, including the decimal point, and 12 after the decimal point. So 3, 6, 9, 12. Yeah, there's 12 digits after the decimal point, 13 digits, and then this would be 14 digits more on this side of the decimal point. Because I don't have a leading zero before the 32, it's not padding it with zeros, it is padding it with spaces. So after looking at multiple examples, practicing this, coming back to the documentation whenever you remember, hey, I might want to use that string format here. This example says, I want to display days just as a floating point number, no decimal points. If I didn't put the dot zero, I'd get a dot zero 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 as a normal display of a double. I don't want anything after the decimal, so the dot zero says don't display any digits after the decimal point. This says give me two digits and nothing after the decimal points, but zero two means had it with a leading zero if it's a one digit number. Same thing here. Print a colon and then leading a number with zero, two digits total nothing after the decimal point, and I'll be giving you a floating point number to convert. Colon, give me a total of five digits, including the decimal point, with leading zeros and two after the decimal point. That's where I get the seconds, and let's now see the effect of that string format, and then we'll get to our animation. So our start, there's my leading zeros. Hours, minutes are all zero. Seconds has a leading zero to it. And when I hit 10, it'll count up. Let's just make sure that once I get to one minute, it will give me the right answer. And while that's counting up now, we've got to think about what we want to happen with our animation of us. Just, we're just going to do animating of one circle on the screen we're going to get this circle to move, to animate across the screen with a vertical and horizontal velocity. And when this timer is running, we'll let this timer not only count our seconds, but also be doing some animation. And if we want the animation to go faster, we could speed up this timer or have a separate timer event that handles the animation part. In the code, the timer is going to call a draw function every time the clock ticks. So all we have to worry about is what code do we run inside of our draw function. I have done a little experimenting, and I first I started out drawing little arcs, and I, and I think you saw some of my drawing little arcs. But I thought, you know what, it'd be cool if, if I were playing a game and having these objects bounce around the screen, It'd be cool that maybe if I click them, they would do something like change direction, or I'd get a point for having caught a, a, uh, something moving and clicked on it at just the right time. So I decided not to just make this a drawing, me drawing a circle, but actually I found out there is a arc object that I can create that will behave like a button and receive key pressed events then I don't have to worry about, oh, you click the button, did it hit one of my objects by checking to see the position I clicked on. I can, if I make this a special object, let Java handle, if I click on it, it will actually receive a mouse pressed event. And then I can say, hey, you clicked on that, I'll keep score for you clicking that. That just opens up a lot of possibilities, moving around objects rather than drawing objects. So I'm, I'm going to add a little level of, I, I'll call it sophistication, it feels sophisticated to me, that I can handle pressing or key press or, or mouse press on this circle. So let's start out by first planning out 
what characteristics we need to have for an object that's going to be moving around on our screen. We're going to first create it with characteristics like a fill color or a stroke color. But then I somehow need it to have a, a velocity, a horizontal velocity and a vertical velocity. What other characteristics should my object have? Is it its position? Initially, is the only thing I really care about. We can add more characteristics to it, but we're planning on having more of these. So let's make a class that will encapsulate all the things that this and more of the same kind of things can be created and moved across our screen. So it's going to be a little more sophisticated than the, than the Python. We're going to treat each of these little things moving around on the screen. They're going to be actual clickable objects. They're going to be JavaFX objects, just like a button object in JavaFX. So it will be clickable. It can receive any events that an arc object in JavaFX can receive. So let's take a look how we would do that. And then we'll start moving this around. So I'm going to stop the timer just because I can, and I'm going to close that application. Let me show you how we created that, how I create that little green field to move things around on, because that wasn't here in our in our uh, stopwatch that we finished up on Monday. So I'm zipping up to the code that I added, and I'll walk walk you through it here. It's right here. Here is the part where I create a canvas for, I was planning at first time on just drawing on the canvas in my draw routine, but then I realized, you know, I'm going to want to have, have a clickable thing. So that's where this comes in. But let's just walk through this code that creates a, a canvas that I can draw in and do special things, but also have my object be moving around inside. So I'm creating a canvas. This, the only reason I have a canvas is to eventually be drawing on it. Notice I give it a name, My Canvas. And since I'm going to be, need to access drawing on that canvas when I get a timer event, both My Canvas and My Pane variables are global in my class. Remember why that is. When I get timer ticks to do my animation, my little timer handler needs to say, hey, Mr. Canvas, do this, or give you the graphics context, or uh, move around something in the pane. Like, I need to know what size it is so I can decide whether my object needs to bounce off the wall or continue to the other side. So I made both of these global way at the top of my class, way up here. I made a variable. You, could, you might as well make this arc variable. These are the three new things that I made publicly available to all methods in my class. I made an arc, and I learned about JavaFX has these objects called arcs, which is behave quite a bit like a button that I can receive click events. Rather than me drawing arcs, I can just use an arc object. Now, as I said, it to be equal to null because I haven't done anything with it yet. I could do the same equal null on these other ones too. I probably should just be consistent. Just to make sure that everything is initialized to an empty pointer. And just to make it clear, anyone reading this code knows that, yes, I meant it to be not have any value yet. Down when I'm starting my program, I'll be assigning values to these. So you have these already in the in where we ended the stopwatch. Here's the three new global objects I think I want to be available to my timer handler events and my keyboard handler events. And then down in my start, I'll jump to this part first. I create a canvas, give it a certain size, 600 by 400. That's this size here. And you can decide if you want a bigger canvas or a smaller canvas. That's a 600 by 400 on this screen. That creates 
this big green spot. Actually, the pane is what gets colored green. I create a canvas. I create a pane that's holding both my canvas and my arc that I'll show in a second here. I'm going to be basically placing my canvas and my arc on the pane. It holds the pane, or the pane holds those objects. Here's how we set the background color of the pane. Do this set style thing. And you get kind of get a, a hint here. I could be actually reading my style. This looks very much like CSS. I can actually have all my style of things in a CSS file. And there's a way to read my style from a file instead of doing it programmatically. But since I'm only doing one thing, setting the background, I'm happy to do it on a line in my program. And just for a little testing, I added this just as an experiment. Display a button on the paint. Also, it doesn't do anything. I didn't get his his position. Without any positions assigned to it, he's up there in the upper left corner of my paint. Now let's take a look at this little arc object. This object is the thing that's going to be initially just one of them moving around on my screen, that I'm eventually going to be moving around on my screen. I create an arc object, and of course the first time I'm going to have to do the include of the Java FX definition of arc. In order just to get it to appear a, on, my, uh, on my pane, I have to do lots of things to it. Maybe there's an, an instantiator or a, uh, a, a method that gets I can handle all these parameters. But I decided I'm going to use each one separately so I remember what all the things I can do. I give it a center, X and Y. I give it a fill and stroke colors. And because arcs are more than just for drawing circles, or and I can even draw ovals, I can give an angle of my the start angle and the length. Actually, I'm going to put start and length next to each other because they're closely related. I'm going to put start angle right there, just so it's clear that the start and length. And let's add comments along the way or two. This is the starting angle. Of drawing. Notice if I made that like a 300, start at 30 and end at, and have a length of 300, I'd have what looked like the little Pac Man arc. So I could draw a little Pac Man guy and actually have him be the Pac Man player. And this is my ending angle. Because it's 360, it's going to be a full circle. And I, and I did this and I couldn't figure out why wasn't it showing up? And then I realized after I looked back at another example that without a radius, I'm, it starts with, by default with a zero radius. So uh, my circle wasn't showing up until I finally realized, oh yeah, you got to tell it the radius. And since I can do ovals, I have both an X and a Y radius. If you want to make it different X and Y radius, you can make it an oval. And then the question is, can you make an oval rotate? That'll be something extra. That'll be really cool. Now this is here because I wasn't getting to show up right away, so I'm going to comment that out. And I don't think I really need it. I tried this until I realized my radius was zero. Remind myself arcs need to know what their radius is. So this is how I create an arc. And remember I made it a global variable right now. Now our, now we got to get this arc to move around on the screen. So far when I run it, and this is something you want to do, before even worrying about animating it, can you get it to show up on your screen. You can choose whatever color you want for your background color for your pane. But 
it once you do this my pain equals a new pain with the canvas and an arc in it your arc should automatically get displayed at this position sent the center at this position with all these characteristics nothing more needs to be done except make a pain and add it to the pain so let's make sure you can get that and then we'll go on. So I'm going to pause it right here to do the code. Closing the console. And then let you see that recurring. So at the start, there's my start. There's the creation of the arc. At the very top, we have global variables. Yes, Molly? Oh, you can use I just ask a question. Okay, I'll just slowly scroll through this. Just so, Jared, you can see the code we did. There's my, I don't think we changed the button handler. Yeah, we did. We added the stop the clock. The clock task, I explained this string formatter thing. And we added the, not only update the clock, but now call my draw routine. Here is the handling of, if you hit a key, change those global variables, velocity x or velocity y, to have specific values. In the draw routine, I, I calculate a new center x and center y, wrapping around when I go to the right, actually this should be the right edge wrap. I haven't done left, I haven't yet done the left and top edge wrap. When I hit zero, figure out what you need to do when you hit zero. And then Here's a great way, all I have to do to get that arc to move is adjust the center X and Y. Arcs behave different than when I draw it. I just notice it causes that goofy little push the window a bit. We'll figure out that. But it's having a, having something that I, that I can click on at some time, I think might make open up a lot of possibilities. All right, I'm pausing now.